drink your fucking Sprite. Okay. I think it's uh, caffeine free. Shut up. I drink your milkshake. Hi everybody, I'm Jim. I'm Ryan. And this is the Concept Crucible Podcast. And today we're going to talk about something that's near and dear to both of us, but for an almost entirely different reasons. Almost, yeah, pretty much. I mean, we're on, well, it's not opposite reasons. The, the same side of the coin, but on different spectrums. Yep. But we're it's, talking about... Oh, sorry. I was going to say it's shoes, but it's not. I was about to lie no. to our audience. I'm sorry. No, don't do that. But we're going to talk about live music today. Live music, yeah. yeah. And so when I say we're on different ends of the spectrum, Jim and I realized that in discussing our experiences with live music, we both have experiences seeing live music. Well, we yeah. both have experiences playing live music. Mm-hmm. But my experience is more on the viewing of live music, and Jim's is more on the playing of live music. Well, and conveniently, about a month and a half ago, mm-hmm. um, we had a weekend where we did each of those things. Mm-hmm. I played at Battle of the Bards with Kaylee, mm-hmm. and you can see that video on the channel. Mm-hmm. And you went and saw Black fucking Sabbath. I, I went and saw Sabbath. They were, they were in Hamilton, and uh, I mean... I don't want to brag. I've seen them like, <laughs> but it's Black Sabbath three, three times in the last three or four years. But yeah, they're on their the end tour, which is according to them, it's going to be the last time they do any kind of major world touring, largely because Tony Iommi has recently had uh, medical problems, and so his body he just can't physically do it anymore. I expect them they're probably going to play a few like really big one off shows here and there, but. Um, I decided, you know what, I may have seen them twice already, but I enjoyed both times. It was it was immensely rewarding, and so why not go and check them out? So nice. yeah, this this uh, on that weekend I went and I gave a pretty good it. show at Bards, but it wasn't Black Sabbath good. <laughs> <laughs> I will yes. admit that there was probably nobody yelling at Let me see your hands. Oh god, that would have been amazing. Yeah. I'm gonna do that next time in that voice. Ozzy, Ozzy, uh, the guy, one of the guys that I went with, he counted it because. We realized that that's something that Ozzy says a lot. And he counted roughly 27 times in about an hour and a half show <laughs> where Ozzy asked to see our hands. And so, in the end, the three of us at the end of our row were just like, just like jazz hands or whatever. Trying Spirit to, fingers! Giving, giving Ozzy what he was yelling for. So, But, yes, we're going to talk about live music today. But first, we should definitely make like a large polar bear and perhaps break the ice. Fair enough. Yes. Uh, Huck, what is the first complete song you could play? So in this case, I'm going to talk about a guitar and I'm not going to talk about like Yankee Doodle or anything like that. Like first like single. Yeah. So um, the first single turns out to be um, Gone Away by The Offspring. Uh, and that's largely thank f- thanks to um, Rocksmith. So, uh, so I this s- is very recent then. This is this is fairly. Re- I mean, oh, I didn't know that. For 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 the longest time, I could play a lot of like Metallica riffs, but I could never connect all of the riffs together to be able to do the coherent song. So the closest I, w- I came was um, Enter Sandman. I could mm-hmm. I could do almost everything, but it got a little muddy in the middle. Um, and it always does. Yeah, I mean, just you know, bridges and whatnot can be kind of weird. And I and I hadn't I hadn't played uh, I haven't played it in a while. So maybe if I you know just spend a couple a, a couple hours on it, I could probably n- nail it out now because I'm a little bit more skilled than I was mm-hmm. when I when I was first noodling on it. But um, but recently I shelled out and I bought um, Rocksmith plus the cable for my console, and then uh, and then I went on a little bit of a download spree and got. <laughs> bunch of songs that were not in the game and i remembered um trying to teach my buddy gone away so it was a song it was one of the first songs that my buddy doug and i gold starred on um guitar rock, hero rock band, rock band. Rock band. um uh, me on guitar him on bass although i, I think i also gold started on drums as well because it's it's not the most complicated at the same time as guitar no oh. no i'm not that talented um so we did fairly well on rock band with it and then when we flirted with the idea of creating a fictional metal band, I tried to teach him how to play the bass, 
with Gone Away because it's a fairly simple chord progression. So I was teaching him the root notes of all the guitar parts. And in that, I could play the riffs, but I had a really hard time with the main lead lick that I just couldn't I couldn't work out how to get my the fingerings to, to work out. So it, fast forward, you know, five or so years, and so now I got... Uh, Rocksmith, and uh, and I downloaded it, and I started playing it, and thankfully it gives you guidance um, in terms of how to position your fingerings in order to to play those complicated parts. Plus, it has the wonderful chunk and loop section where you can slow down the tempo mm. and and change the difficulty, and then you know if you hit your successes, it'll it'll give you the next evolution in speed and complexity. And I just eventually built it up, and then suddenly one day tried it out and it scored me at 100%. I'm nice. like, Phew. I mean, I know I miss notes, but it must score you in terms of like there's a mastery mode which I'm sitting at like 94% and then there's I guess the completion for the average player, which is I think where the 100% comes in. And then on Saturday, just this past Saturday of, of filming, I got 101% on it. Ooh. So I, I don't know what's going on with the game. Maybe I broke it with my awesomeness, but yeah, apparently I'm doing fairly well. So that was a very long-winded yeah. icebreaker of how, how and what my first right, song how about was. King of the long-winded icebreaker. Um, yeah, well, I, I didn't realize it was that recent though. That's really interesting. Yeah. Uh, so mine, uh, I started playing guitar when I was about 15, mm-hmm. and my friends taught me a couple of songs. I learned to play a couple of songs in guitar class, like. Um, Bad Moon Rising mm-hmm. and um, Doll Parts by Hole. Of all the songs you could teach, a, like I mean, it was it was it was 1997. Okay, mm-hmm. it was it was a, a weird year. It was a weird time. Mm-hmm. Um, but when I was 16, the first song that I learned to play and sing at the same time, which is which is what I, I sort of count as the first song that I learned to play, uh, because I don't play lead, I play rhythm. Mm-hmm. Is was. Uh, Round here by County Crows, mm-hmm. and that was that was it was really hard, but it was one of the, the first step on that road of oh I can do these things at the same time like other people. Mm-hmm. Also, FYI, if you start learning to play bass in your fake metal metal band, um, Steel Panther rules say that you now have a real metal band. Like, <laughs> fair enough. If any band is a fake real band, it's clearly Steel Panther. Yeah, and they are a real band. <laughs> No, oh, that is true. That is true. Link below for that time that Steel Panther invited a guy on there, got, got a guy on stage with him, and he rocked through Eyes of the Panther. <laughs> and you're like, damn, they're a real band. <laughs> there are Steel Panthers amazing. Mm-hmm. But the bands I would love to see live. Mm-hmm. But yeah, mine was mine was around here by the Counting Crows. Um, because when I was a 16 year old boy, that was a song that deeply spoke to me. Mm-hmm. And also, I couldn't learn to play colorblind on guitar because I couldn't transcribe the piano piece to a guitar piece, and I didn't have the internet because it basically hadn't been invented yet. Mm-hmm. Oh man! But so seeing live music. I mean, you went to see Sabbath. Mm-hmm. And so what was the first... That was the latest show you, you've seen. What was the first show you ever saw? So, okay, there's probably shows that I, I saw before this, um, or at least performances. First concert that yeah, you but, went to. but the first concert that I distinctly remember, and I distinctly remember going to, mm-hmm. was Britney Spears. Um, no judgment. Yeah, no judgment. There's probably... So there's probably somebody, like... John, my boss, who listens to the podcast, is probably laughing at me right now. Um, I'm excited for that. Yeah, but the the long story short is I was visiting family, and they I was visiting for a month. They needed something to do with me for the month. So sorry, I should I should interject by saying by what I mean by I'm excited for that is leave right alone. <laughs> Oh no no no! I apologize sure. for anyone to for anyone wearing headphones because I just leave Ryan alone into your molars. No, it's okay. John John teases me, but in a in a constructive <laughs> way that makes me thicker skinned and sometimes lash out at him. Excellent. Um, anyway, so yeah, I was visiting family and we they needed they wanted to plan out things to do over the month, so uh, different things got scheduled, like trips to see other family close by in Ontario, mm-hmm. um, going to see Phantom of the Opera in Toronto, mm-hmm. and... The yearly pilgrimage to Britney Spears. Yeah, and they said, well, you are, and I was like, 
11 or 12 at the time. They're like, you're around the age, and uh, and my future brother, uh, stepbrother, uh, I was going to say brother-in-law, but my future stepbrother, um, he's, he's apparently into Britney Spears or something, sure. and I never knew who she was. I, I was living in Texas at the time, so different demographics and whatnot. I'd never heard of her. But they're like, yeah, I know, this is what all the boys your age like. For probably obvious reasons, but, you know, whatever. And uh, so, yeah, we ended up seeing her at the Molson Amphitheater. Nice. So that was my that was my first concert. But the first concert that I count was my graduation gift from my parents, and that was when I saw Metallica in, like, 03, 04. So, mm. so that's my first real concert, if anybody asks. So, Jim... What was your first live show? My first live show that I went to... My first one that I went to was a school trip concert. Mm. But my first one that I went to, sort of of my own volition, was actually one of those free music festivals that Mm. occurs every once in a while in big cities. And so mine was Beach Fest, Mm -hmm. which had... uh, Oh, when would that have been? That would have been year 2000. Okay. So... Um, Collective Soul was there. Jan Arden was there. She was amazing. Um, it was one of those like big all day music festivals, and we were out there all day. And um, like it was, it was a huge thing. And the last music that I saw that wasn't that, that was like reasonably large venue that wasn't like Poetry Slam or you know like small like less than thirty people was Carsey Blanton in, mm. in uh, November. And the next one that I see will also be Carsey Blanton, probably. Because we're definitely catching something on her next tour. Mm-hmm. Uh, so what is seeing live music like for you? For me, it's like really weird, but we'll get to that. Um, so it was, it was kind of funny when we were doing the pre-show. Um, I hadn't necessarily reflected on it, so it's, it's really hard for me to capture. Um, because I am definitely... So I go, I participate as a member of the fan or of the audience, Mm -hmm. but I'm not as emotive as some people are when they go. Like, uh, there are some people who are very excited, like, to the point of they can't... At a metal concert, I would imagine. Yeah, (laughs) where they can't contain themselves in in their excitement and how how emotive they are and, you know, the, the band throws out all their energy at the, the crowd and the crowd, you know, just reflects it and amplifies it back with their own energy, right? Um, I don't know, maybe the cynical side of me of, like, I'm one tiny member of an entire crowd so I don't necessarily have to cheer louder or clap how, louder, right? You know, that's, I, the, <laughs> that's the worst thing. You know what happens if you clap with your hands in your pockets, Ryan? You'll crush your testicles. Yeah, well, I no, 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 I, I definitely clap like it's not that but like when they're like i can't hear you and everybody's like yeah like it's it's really fun to sit back and not participate in that because then you get to like feel the effect of everybody else yelling and stuff but but so when i when i go to shows um you'll typically find me in the same spot which is um if i'm not close to the audio guy because usually at a metal show you know the audio guy will be set up well, he's across. got the best seat in the house. Yeah, because he's got a he or she. Uh, it's always been he's uh, yeah. at my shows, but um, they got to be able to to have frontline access to to the the full effect of of the audio. But so I'll often stand close to the audio guy. But if I'm not, then you're gonna find me closer to the back of the venue because and Doug and I are usually the ones who go to these shows. We're both tall guys, so we don't want to be blocking anybody's view if we can help it. Uh, and it's very we, nice of you. Well, yeah. And we also typically stay away from the pit. Um, I've never really had an interest in being in a mosh pit, and Doug has outgrown his desire to be in a mosh pit. So we usually stay far away from it. Not that we think that there's anything wrong with it, just not for us. We don't feel like being sweaty and bloody and such. So, um, But yeah, my experience typically is... Um, I enjoy the Sonic experience when it's not bad. Like, ACC's got a really... Or the Rogers Center's just got a really bad PA system, in my opinion. So it's just Mm. loud and muddied. 
Um, but I enjoy the sonic experience. Um, I enjoy the kind of percussive experience with, with the low bass and how you can feel the music not in any kind of weird foo-foo way, but literally like, you can feel the sound waves crushing into your body and, and vibrating through your hollow cavities. <laughs> I, I enjoy that. And I enjoy... Well, and I enjoy hearing hearing the the music live that I really enjoy on disc or yep. in, on MP3. So that that's that's a fun experience. But then the the last layer to that is as a person who tries to play music and a, as a person who noodles around with riffs, I really enjoy watching the technical aspect of a show. So um, seeing seeing them playing guitar, seeing them playing the rhythm sections. Um, Picking, it's it's not. Uh, I don't pick out the flaws in a negative way, but it's always fun to see where they fuck up. So uh, a couple weeks ago, um, friends of mine were opening for actually a fairly large metal band that I, I enjoy. So their band was Rippered. They were opening for a band uh, called Trivium, and I'd seen mm-hmm. Trivium once before, but Trivium was playing here in Kitchener. So I'm like. Yeah, I mean, my buddies are playing and they're opening for Trivium. Why am I not going? So I, I went to the show. I remember there was a section. So the bassist name is Paulo, and Paulo starts playing, and you could see the the front man um, Matt, who uh, also he plays guitar and, and and sings or vocalizes for the band. You see him. He snaps his head over at at Paulo, and he's like. You're so off. Like he's pointing at the headstock. Like you're so off, and you can see, and you can hear it too. Like this is one of those times where normally you think like, the, oh, the bass doesn't really make a difference. It like, makes it, a difference it, 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 when it's off. Keeper of the groove. Yeah, you know when it's off, it makes a difference. And this is one of the first times where I could hear the bass because I, I could hear that it was not where it was supposed to be. Um, and obviously they're getting like not only are they getting it from the speakers but they're getting it from the, their inner monitors right so he yeah. could hear right away that it was that the bass was was playing it was tuned wrong or out of tune whatever the, nice. the, the it happened to be so you see Paulo he walks over he stands in front of the cabinet and you can see him tuning back up and he comes out and he starts playing a few notes and, and Matt looks over and he's like oh, you're so off <laughs> and so Paulo goes back <laughs> retunes his guitar looks over and Matt's just like yeah okay <laughs> so they like the they didn't stop the show. They didn't no, do anything. Like, never this, was, this was all on the fly. Um, and thankfully, Trivium has two guitars, then a bass guitar, right? So, I mean, the two guitars were able to fill out the rest of the Sonic experience uh, before Paulo rejoined them on the bass. But um, I I got a kick out of that. I got a kick out of, like, yeah, the it was, it was probably, like, nobody's fault in particular, just one of those oversight things, you know. It's live. Shit happens. Yeah, a, I, a headstock got bumped or something, and... I well, I mean, if you saw Adele's performance at the Grammys, no, I did not. But. Um, one of the things that happened was a a piano mic fell inside a piano and hit the strings. Oh, and that is bad. Yeah. Uh, and it and and the result was that like they had to like cut her audio. Mm. Um, and there was a lot of flack about it. And I, Adele had a tweet about it. I think the the next day, like, like I mean, she was upset about it, but her tweet was, "It's live. Shit happens." Yeah. I, I two years ago I think I was on stage at Nerdfest, and I, I've told the story before at least once mm-hmm. on the podcast. But I broke a string on stage in my first set, yeah. and I'm just like, well, can't stop the song. Got to finish the song. Finish the song. And happily, there was a there was another guitarist there to bail me out because I didn't have any spare strings. Now I bring spare strings to every uh, show, and I change my strings two weeks before a show. Yeah. Um, so that to make sure that they not not only to make sure that they sound good, but also to make sure that they're not about to break, mm-hmm. um, because I've been you know there I'm using my practice strings and they've been on my guitar for you know, six years. Mm-hmm. But yeah, no, like I I definitely watch the technical stuff too. Now that I think about it, like for me, it's watching bands and trying to sort of steal their power and steal their energy. I, I watch what their guitarists are doing. I watch where they put their eyes, where they put their heads, what they what they do with their guitars, how they handle them, and you know I'm sort of trying to steal their power, and partly because m- more often than not their guitars is better than me, at least, and, and certainly more technically proficient. Mm-hmm. Um, so I wanna I wanna understand those little tips and tricks, and I don't think there's any better way to do it. Well, you know, apart from you know actually learning, um, than watching someone try and do it live. 
because that's that is the point of stress where like this is the real deal there's no take backs there's no do overs and sometimes you need a do over mm -hmm. um like you know you're reaching the base um or the 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 recording that made it to the album for good riddance <laughs> yeah like yeah one of the most famous examples of do 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 fuck do 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 <laughs> yeah, it's that's a thing. Um, but no, it, like when we saw Carsey, um, there was a point where her audio had to cut out in the middle of a song, and she had to she had to restart it. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, it's it is part of I think it is part of being a good audience member to be understanding about that. Mm -hmm. Like shit happens. Yeah. There's there are so many moving parts at a live show. Yeah, and there are so many moving parts that you don't see. You know, there's there's tech people running around. There's there there's people who are responsible for arranging the mics, balancing the mics, everything that happens. And it is, I would say, almost always better to like laugh about those little moments, but ultimately forget about them mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and remember the part where the artist completely effing rocked it. Yeah, because those parts exist too, and. It is important not to let the little stuff overshadow the stuff that matters, mm -hmm. and that, like that is my my sort of my sort of experience of of, of seeing live music mm -hmm. um, is that kind of thing is 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 it helps me realize the stuff that matters. Mm -hmm. um, if you put me in a room with a lot of noise and really nothing to do visually or anything like that I tend to get overstimulated really quickly mm -hmm. and I start to I, I sort of frame it as ha realizing I have a lot of spare processing cycles and I start to think like it just my brain starts to really go mm -hmm. not in a way that's necessarily creative or productive or useful it just because I don't have a lot to focus on I start finding stuff to focus on and as long as I can keep that sort of turned outward, it's fine. Mm. Um, and the result is that, like, any time I go to the symphony or the poetry slam or anything like that, like, I always take a ton of notes just about whatever. Half the time they're unintelligible afterward. Mm -hmm. But I just need that outlet. Mm -hmm. If I'm at a music festival with a bunch of people, odds are very good that I'm going to get really irritating really fast. <laughs> Because I don't have that out, and like now I know when I bring stuff, like I to, stuff to write with, stuff to stuff to channel that. Because if I don't, I'm just going to talk to people, and I'm just going to annoy the crap out of them. Mm -hmm. Like nobody, nobody really wants to talk with me for an hour and a half about nothing while there's a show going on. Like, the symphony is different because the symphony you don't freaking talk at the symphony. You don't check your phone. No, it's the symphony. You shut up and you listen. No, yeah. and really that's how I try and behave at any concert. If this person is pouring their ass out. That's the wrong turn of phrase for that. That was a sentence that just happened, though. But no, they're pouring their energy <laughs> at the audience. And they've put so much work into this. And so much practice into this. Like I said, this is the moment that really matters. And I feel an obligation to be a good audience member. Even if I don't like the band. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they're the opening band or whatever. Like, like... I know, like as a, as an as an artist, the best thing I can do is be the biggest fan while they're on stage, because everything I give to them, they're going to give back, mm -hmm. and it's a really really good feeling, mm -hmm. you know. And it is the same thing, like if I'm opening for somebody or I'm I'm playing a show, is is everybody else who's, who who I share that stage with, you know, for that night I am their biggest fan, mm -hmm. because. We are there to create a show together, mm -hmm. and I think the same is true of audience members: is that you are you are creating the show with the band. Yeah, that's how you do it as a street performer too. Is your audience is part of the show? They're not the people you do the show for. Mm -hmm. It isn't television. We can see you, mm -hmm. and the notion of of being seen, I think, is what really gets me mm -hmm. about about live music, which is really weird because I've been to the symphony a bunch of times, which is completely impersonal. Like it's beautiful, but. <clears throat> the first chair violinist isn't like, yeah, you in the front row! <clears throat> Partly because violins don't make that sound. Yeah, I imagine there's got to be at least one violinist out there who like, does that sometimes. To 100%. <laughs> I will bet you that person did not stay first chair for very long. Yeah. 
Yeah. <laughs> like, I've seen some pretty crazy violin stuff. I saw video games live at, uh, at Center of the Square with the um, Kitchener Waterloo Orchestra, mm-hmm. and they were amazing. But and their their and their their first year violinist got to he got to rock out, um, but he did not get to like Black Sabbath the audience. He did not get to yell, "Show me your hands!" Show me your hands! I really like um, Mike D from Kill Switch Engage because he 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 re- recognizes um, the value of acknowledging when a fan's having a good time, and he he's like got those practice moves where he like he's playing, he looks down. He points out. He, he'll, he'll point you out. He'll point That's you out. He'll, he'll, he'll do the smile thing or whatever. Or he'll be like, "Yeah, I see you. I, I see what you're well, doing." Well, that's out the there. thing, and then that's the thing too. Is like, like that is that is the thing that I think that is the thing that creates a connection with you in the audience. And part mm-hmm. is, is the notion, and and, and that's what makes live what makes live events significant. Is mm-hmm. I see you, you see me. Mm-hmm. I see people singing my music mm-hmm. along with me. Like, this is... This stadium, this bar, this coffee house, whatever, this is our car. Mm-hmm. And we are going somewhere together, and we are all listening to the same motherfucking soundtrack. Yeah. And that is an awesome feeling. That, to be fair, I have never had... Uh, that's not true, actually. I, when, when I have played covers, and people will sing along. Mm-hmm. Um, but one day, I will play to a group of people who sing along with my own songs... Mm-hmm. And, and with Kaylee's songs, and that will be a good effing day, day. But it's not today, and I'm okay with that. We've kind of transitioned topics because uh, we started off talking about seeing live music, but as I pointed out at the top of the show, you and I fall on a different different sides of the spectrum where you've played live music yep. more than I have. I mean, my experience, it's limited to high school and karaoke in high school i was in um the junior and senior bands um which is like the concert bands i played tuba um i flirted with playing trumpet and trombone and and all that jazz i'd signed the instruments out for like a weekend and learned yeah but uh, I was a tuba player all the way through. Started in grade six, played grade six, grade seven, skipped grade eight when I came back to Canada because they don't have that in public schools. Mm-hmm. And then nine all the way through my victory lap of high school, I played tuba. Nice. And uh, and I was a part of the band all the way through. And I know a lot of tuba players. Yeah. I don't know. It's just not a- one of them actually owns a tuba. <laughs> FYR. <laughs> not what? Yeah. Tubes are expensive. I get they're, it. They're expensive. Uh, so so yeah, I I remember playing in the concerts and whatnot, and um, playing playing in a group that size. I imagine is probably significantly different than performing. That's my understanding groups. of it. Yeah, I've never played in a in a group larger than four. Yeah. So I don't have a lot of experience with that. Yeah, so when, when I was playing, uh, and especially because I was a tuba, we didn't have solos, so I was always, in a supporting role is probably the wrong wrong phrase, but it was always in the collective. We all played together to create mm-hmm. one, you know, yeah. sonic experience. And so my experiences were always tailored to that. I was a part of the group, we were all conducted by one person who gave us the direction that we needed. Um... But it was it was always a very fun experience. It always validated all those early morning practices that the bands had to go through, and um, I mean we did we did uh, the processions and whatnot for graduation ceremonies. We went to competitions. We played concerts like the Christmas concerts and whatnot. And then a few on the road. Uh, when I was in middle school, we did pre marching band stuff where the band would go and sit in the bleachers at a football game and we play the songs, but we never actually took the stage to march. Um, I would have if I was if I did high school down there, but mm-hmm. uh, and then so that's that's the core of my live experience. And then I did karaoke, which is a solo experience, but it's a little different. It's still music, but not really. I, I don't know. It's kind of hard for me to to parse it out. But that's the limit of my playing live my th- experience. My thing with karaoke, and I have done a lot of karaoke too, mm-hmm. as as you were well aware. We did a podcast on karaoke back in season one. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, my thing with that is that I don't like car- singing karaoke is in, in, in a group of people, like even in a group of people that you know, um, 
you know, in a bar is like watching YouTube videos with a bunch of other people. Mm -hmm. Everyone is is laughing at the YouTube videos, but they're not thinking about the the video. They're not thinking about the thing that's actually happening. They're thinking, oh, I know what video to show next. And in karaoke, it's the same sort of thing. Is that everybody is sort of they're doing their own thing. They're looking for their own songs. They're they're you know they're drinking. They're whatever. Like, um, your your music is sort of incidental, and that seems neat, but. It seems, and I, I like it because it takes a lot of the pressure off. You know, it's one of those things that people people often feel a lot of pressure around karaoke, mm-hmm. and there isn't because not a lot of people care, and the people who do care are dicks. Anybody who's going to judge you for your karaoke singing is an asshole. Yeah, it's like way to way to screw up that t-ball hit, man. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks for that. I had a very tragic t-ball experience as a child. But no, for for me, like I, I played one live show when I was sixteen. Um, it was very very small, um, and it went okay. I don't really remember much of it, but I was sufficiently embarrassed by it that I did not do so again, and would not until I was in grad school. Mm. Uh, and I played, I recorded, I'd recorded a bunch of music that summer, and I played. Uh, a Movember benefit at Maxwell's Music House. Because somebody had asked me, and I went, I have a guitar. Yes. Yes, I will. I was nervous as hell. But it was a lot of fun. We had a good time. We connected with the audience. And don't remember much about it. There's a video somewhere. Uh, there's definitely a video somewhere. I think it might be on my old channel. I'll try and hunt it up. It's it's not great, but It exists. And since then, I have basically played at every opportunity. Anytime somebody's like, hey, do you want... Like, I played with Argyle Speedo. I played with the Berliners, which were a jazz band. Um, we started Wutsu Riot, and we've played her regulars at, at a couple of local open mics. We just played a Battle of the Bards. I don't know when our, what our next gig is. Um, we've played at speaking events and art shows and all kinds of stuff. Like any any opportunity I have to just pick up a guitar and go go somewhere, I will usually go. Mm-hmm. Uh, I joke that I'm the only person they get to play at Alta Crea, the local nerd art show, because I'm the only one who will do a 90 minute set. <laughs> so you basically played as long as Sabbath did. Yeah, only not nearly as well as Sabbath. Um, I also didn't play any Sabbath. <laughs> I'm just a dude with an acoustic guitar and an <laughs> awesome, awesome musical partner. But yeah, there, there, the experience of playing playing live for me, like I've almost always been either solo or in a very small group. I mean, with the riot, I am typically the lead. Mm-hmm. Uh, very rarely do I not run both guitar and vocals. There are definitely a few songs where I don't. And those song, the amount of those songs are is, is increasing, but there, yeah, there, there's for me, there's nothing better. I mean, I used to get it when I was on stage juggling and doing magic, and now I play music, and it fills me with energy. If you go back to that uh, Battle of the Bards video, I am dying. I have the flu that weekend. <laughs> I was two days into the flu. The flu, and I, I was, I was hopped up on medication, and lozenges, and everything else. I had a pocket full of tissues, and I was just like, I just have to get through this seven-minute performance, and I almost did. The part I cut, which I don't know if I'll put it up on the channel. I don't. I, I certainly haven't by now. Is um, there was a spot right at the end of, of unconditional, where my voice just gave out. And I just, I did not have any more. And everybody loved it anyway. Mm-hmm. And I, you know, I, we came out, we we did the, the best that we could, which was still pretty good, I think, listening to it again. But it doesn't matter. Like, it filled me with energy. I love it. I'm like, yeah, next Bards, we're going to do cooler things. You know, we're not just going to 
play music. We're going to put out more energy. We're going to have a better show. We're going to, you know, maybe screw around with some improv or some props or that kind of thing. We don't know yet. Next part is a little ways away. It's probably not until, like, uh, summer, uh, October, Thanksgiving area. Um, but, like, it's that, it's that sort of energy. And, and the more of that energy we can give, the more we'll get. Mm-hmm. And it's a really sort of tangible relationship. But, yeah, playing live music is, is thinking about it makes me excited and happy. Because I don't do it enough. No. One day. <laughs> One day I might even join you. Yeah, as our as our erstwhile fake bass player. Yeah. Like I said, man, when you start learning to play the bass, you're a real bass player. I mean, and, I, and I've already appeared in one video. Playing fake bass. Playing yes. fake bass with a broken foot. Right. Uh, and you played real bass. You played real bass in the songwriting podcast. Yeah. So it's possible. Mm-hmm. One day. Maybe next Christmas video. Maybe. But do you have any final thoughts on playing live music? Uh, no, I mean, I've got a show coming up in April that I'm going to watch. Uh, a new Kill, uh, Kill Switch Engage is dropping a new album next month, and so they're starting their touring cycle. So nice. So I'm going to go down to London and see them. Um... I guess maybe one thing I would say from a watching music point of view is I know everybody's financial situations are a little different, but I would say that if you're looking at a, at a the prospect of going to a show and you're like humming and hawing, like, mm, do I want to go? Do I want to pay the ticket price? Uh, I would say that unless it is like prohibitively out of your capacity to pay for it, you really should do you, it at yeah. least once. Uh, and I've got two time, like two cases in my history where I couldn't justify the ticket, and they weren't that expensive, you know, like twenty five, thirty five bucks. Because metal shows typically don't run very much. Um, even Sabbath was only like sixty or eighty bucks. You know, that's in the grand scheme of things, that's not a lot. Like you sometimes hear of really expensive, mm-hmm. you know, pop acts and whatnot, which all the more power to them if they. That's the market if they can, yeah, get money for it. But there was two times, once with Killswitch and another with a band that I followed as I lay dying. Uh, Killswitch came through Kitchener when I was still in undergrad, second or third year, uh, and I couldn't justify the ticket to myself. And then their lead singer, uh, a couple years later, uh, left the band. And he... Killswitch has had two vocalists. Um, the original one who left the one that I wanted to see who then left, and then the original guy came back to to his role in the in the band. And they're very different vocalists, like, you know, in terms of writing style, in terms of in terms of the actual uh, way they 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 sing and and scream. Um, I really wanted to see Howard because he was the he was the one that I got introduced to the band with. And now, I'm never going to be able to see him perform unless he joins them on stage for some reason. And I, I mean, I, I, I've seen Kill Switch with the original vocalist back, and I've loved every single show. But there's that little part of me that's like, ah, I could have seen them back mm-hmm. in the day if I had just eaten the $35 cost. As a student, it felt like $35. It was such a frivolous thing to spend it on. And it's the same with As I Lay Dying. They were swinging through London. I could have gone to the show. And then, well, in this case, this is a slightly sadder story. The the singer is now in jail because he tried to hire a hit guy to kill his ex-wife. Very few things about that seem sad, actually. If, that, if you try and hire yeah. a hitman to kill your wife, jail is probably where you yeah. need to be. But I really, really liked their music, and I really uh, wish I could But jail is probably yeah. where you need to be. Yeah, I really wish I could have seen... The, the band before because they they didn't carry on with, the, with yeah. the, they they for, the rest of the guys formed a new band um, so there's a good chance I will probably never see them play live and I really really wish I could have seen them play live I really enjoy their album music and uh, so yeah so really long winded last thought but my take home message is unless it is extremely prohibitively too costly um, if you're ever looking at a show. Mm-hmm. Just, just do it. I mean, I don't think you're ever gonna regret it's, spending it's, the money. It's on like, something it's like, like that. travel. You're, yeah. you're, you're gonna, you're gonna have an experience. Um, yeah, I mean, always go to shows within your budget. Yeah, and and you know, your budget is is the winner in all contests. Mm-hmm. But yeah, for me, it was uh, George Watsky was touring mm. and in Canada with uh, his last release, Cardboard Castles. Um, 
And, hey, I really love that album. Mm-hmm. And he came to Toronto. And I could totally afford to go. And it was, like, on my birthday weekend. And I found out about it with enough time to buy tickets. I was like, oh, I'd have to go to Toronto. And I didn't go. Mm-hmm. And I've se- I have since seen George Washington. I saw him at VidCon. And he's awesome. Uh, live. But... That is a show I could have gone to, and I didn't, and I didn't because of just because I was like not even because I couldn't afford it, but because I was lazy, mm-hmm. and it was, the, it was my pedestrian laziness that <laughs> that beat me out of that one. Well, at least you got to to redeem yourself. To I lucked out that he was he was headlining. He he no, well he wasn't headlining. Um, he played at the VidCon concert, but the headliners were We the Kings. Okay, but um, yeah, he was he was in there with. Uh, Nice Peter and Epic Lloyd after Epic Rap Battles of History Live, mm-hmm. which are also really fun. Mm-hmm. Uh, so yeah, go and see live shows. Tell yeah. us about live shows that you've seen down below. Mm-hmm. Link two clips of them. Um, you can see some of our live music in the show notes. Um, we are also regulars at the KW Poetry Slam. If you want to come by and see us for live in person, you can even talk to us. I'll warn you, we are extraordinarily awkward people. <laughs> Really awkward. Not saying don't talk to us. I'm just saying, be aware when I stare at you with a look of panic and tell you I need a muffin. <laughs> you don't have to buy the muffin. I'll buy the muffin. I just, I did that one time and Here's I was the five. I just, I just had no idea what to do. They're like, I really liked your song. I'm like, that's really cool. They're like, yeah, and you talked about, you know, issues relating to mental health and. And I'm like, "Uh uh-huh, I need a muffin. (laughs) I did get a muffin, and it was delicious, but (laughs) it was really not how I should have handled that. Um, But yes, you can uh, come and see us, and we'll say hello to you. And, but in the meantime, we'll see you later. Yep. I'm Jim. I'm Ryan. We are signing off. Show me your hands! (laughs) <laughs> I knew you were going to do that and I still <laughs> I couldn't <laughs> I just saw that happening in my mind and went no <laughs> he's going to say something stupid like stay musical <laughs>